Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Thomas. Ladies and gentlemen, dear innovators, welcome back to our disruptive session. The overarching theme today is digitization. And now we don't talk about how digital or digitization disrupts traditional business. Today we talk about how digital is disrupted. Intuitively, when we talk about digitization, everyone thinks about an architecture of myriads of ones and zeros. That is the general architecture of bits and bytes that we all grew up with. Now, we are entering a world beyond this classical digital wisdom when we talk about quantum computing where instead of these one and zero based operations, we do them now based on superpositions, on entanglements, which means basically nothing else, that the status and the quants are not really one or really zero, something in between, and they all cross-influence each other. And why is that? The basic reason is that we can do computing and computational operations substantially dimensionally faster than in classical computing. And why this, is all, this all matters also for business and why this will disrupt computing and all our businesses in future, I'm really glad to have two very distinguished speakers who can explain that far better than I can. The first one, and I'm really, really happy to welcome Stephen Jordan from Seattle, who is live with us today here on the screen. Stephen, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Quite early in Seattle now, isn't it? Yes, yes. So just to introduce you briefly, so Stephen Jordan is a principal researcher in the quantum systems group at Microsoft and holds an adjunct fac faculty affiliation at the University of Maryland. His research is primarily in quantum computing, especially quantum algorithms and quantum complexity theory. In 2019, you was a res recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and you serve on the editorial board of American Physical Society journal PRX Quantum, and you are the author and maintaining, maintainer of the Quantum Algorithm Zoo. No idea what this is, but we are really, really excited to hear about your talk and uh, learn more about this exciting new field of computing. Stephen, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. So, uh, do you see my slides? Aha, perfect. not advance. Hmm. Aha. Perfect. So, and ask for what? Ah, good. Why should we care about quantum computing? Um, despite all of the advancements that we've made in uh, computing over the past 50 years, there still remain many problems which are really uh, out of reach of today's computational techniques. And a lot of these are really planetary scale problems impacting our environment, our energy systems, our food supplies, healthcare, and more. And so today, uh, scientists and technologists are looking into uh, quantum computing as an emerging technology that can solve some problems which are far beyond the capacity of conventional computers. And quantum mechanics is the language of nature. It is the set of rules by which atoms and molecules operate. 
And so by building computers which operate themselves according to these rules, you can simulate atoms and molecules uh, much more efficiently by essentially operating in, in their own language. And so let's look at a concrete uh, example of what we mean by that. So here's a um, representation of the problem of computing the ground state energy of a molecule. And as this is a very uh, important problem from a practical point of view, understanding new, discovering new drugs and uh, developing more advanced materials. And this is solved in industry quite frequently, but it's a very hard problem. As you increase the size of the molecule that you want to uh, simulate, the cost of this uh, um, computational problem grows exponentially. And so if you show how long it takes to solve this problem versus the number of atoms uh, in the molecule, you get a very intimidating exponential curve like this. And before long, with even modest size uh, molecules, you end up with problems that would take more than the age of the universe to solve on conventional computers. Now, conventional computers are not standing still. Um, they increase in their speed. And so if you replot this curve with anticipated gains in computing speed, say with exascale uh, supercomputers, it pushes the curve down a little bit. But if you plot what this should look like with quantum computers, it's just a completely different curve. It doesn't just get pushed down. Uh, quantum computers are not simply a new type of computer with a faster clock speed. Instead, it's really a different type of computer in which the scaling of the problems is completely different than in conventional classical computers. So on a quantum computer, the computational time that it takes to simulate a molecule actually grows only uh, polynomially with the size of the molecule. And so you can actually scale this in a way that classical computers do not scale and simulate the much larger, more complicated molecules that, that people really want to uh, address. So, um, so far I focused on um, quantum algorithms for simulating uh, various different molecules, but quantum computers are not restricted only to that problem. And in general, the problems that look most promising for quantum computing are not necessarily big data problems, but rather big compute problems. So there are a lot of different things that can be the limiting factor in um, a computation. The bottleneck could be uh, computational or the bottleneck um, could be um, just the input output uh, into your problem. And in the case that the bottleneck is input output, quantum computing doesn't necessarily help. That's not really changed by quantum mechanics. So the problems that we look for to apply quantum computers to are ones where you can specify the problem with a modest amount of data, but the amount of compute to actually solve it is very large. And so I've shown one example of that already, which is simulation of molecules. But there are other examples like that. Um, there are examples from cryptography, which are now very famous. In 1994, Peter Shore discovered a polynomially scaling quantum algorithm for factoring large integers. And so just writing down this integer with say 100 or a few hundred uh, digits is very small data, but to um, decompose that into its prime factors is an extremely hard computational problem for classical computers, uh, an easy problem for quantum computers. Another potential good uh, application that we focus on a lot um, because of its widespread industrial applications is uh, optimization problems, which can also be uh, very hard compute problems. So to address uh, these different kinds of problems, we take a full stack approach. And at the bottom of the stack, you have what are called the qubits. Qubit stands for quantum bit, and that's what uh, quantum computers are uh, built out of instead of bits. And so at Microsoft, uh, our approach is to pursue a very ambitious kind of uh, qubit called topologically protected qubits. And the purpose of this is that uh, conventional qubits um, are very fragile things. Um, you may have heard of Schrodinger's cat, which can be dead and alive at the same time. As soon as you measure it, 
it collapses to one state. And that's what you don't want a cuit to do. And really a measurement is any disturbance to the system that carries off information about it. So uh, topological qubits are a uh, long-term play to have a scalable way of making robust qubits. We also have uh, a cloud infrastructure where we, it's, it's really an open infrastructure. And so we have also third-party um, quantum computing hardware that you can access over the uh, Azure uh, Compute Cloud. This includes uh, um, ion trap quantum computers from IonQ and Honeywell and uh, integrating uh, superconducting qubit computers from QCI. And you can actually access these already in a private preview. So beyond the qubits, you really need uh, many different layers to address uh, real problems. Our focus is on uh, impact for real world uh, industrial problems that our customers have. And so to really get that impact on top of the qubits, you need uh, compilers, you need debuggers, you need profilers, you need a uh, cloud computing infrastructure. And we're really building uh, all of those pieces. And at the very top of the uh, uh, stack, we have the um, applications and we work directly with uh, subject matter experts to understand the end applications uh, of quantum computing. So we at Microsoft are never going to know more about the energy industry than players in the energy industry. We're never going to know more about pharmaceuticals than pharmaceutical companies. So we form partnerships to work together uh, to apply quantum computers to these problems. And we do so using um, these development tools that are built to a standard which um, professional software developers have come to expect uh, all kinds of uh, um, nice debuggers, compilers, uh, syntax highlighting, integrated development environment, uh, cloud computing infrastructure, and so on. Our computer, uh, we have a special purpose computer language for quantum computers called Q Sharp, uh, and as well as an open source uh, set of uh, primitives written in Q Sharp called the Quantum Development Kit. So let's uh, get into uh, a concrete example of optimization. So it turns out that um, through our focus on end user um, applications, we found that um, optimization comes up very frequently. And there are actually present day ways that we can um, help customers with their optimization problems, which actually uses insights that come from the quantum information community, but does not uh, necessarily use qubits. And so we call this uh, quantum inspired optimization. And so the idea here is that if you have some complicated energy landscape, you might want to find the minimum, but you could be stuck in some local minimum. And there are many conventional ways of trying to uh, achieve this, such as imitating thermal physics, which is called a very successful algorithm called simulated annealing. And instead we can emulate uh, quantum physics, quantum tunneling, a uniquely quantum mechanical phenomenon, but one that it turns out we can simulate effectively uh, using conventional computers and using techniques that have been developed in the physics community over the last few decades. And so in this way, we can find better solutions to optimization problems than using conventional algorithms. And so we call this quantum inspired uh, approach and it can, um, it can operate on our uh, scaled out classical uh, cloud hardware. So we have a number of uh, case studies with this. Uh, we've worked with a company called OTI to use this for development of new organic light emitting diodes. Uh, we worked with a startup called OneQubit on um, applying these methods to pharmaceutical problems and with JIJ on traffic optimization. JIJ works closely with uh, Toyota on, on this problem. So uh, uh, just to dive in a little bit more concretely to a specific uh, case study from the utilities industry, we've looked at using this for um, the unit commitment problem, which is a problem of optimally um, scheduling the startup and shutdown of gas turbines uh, or other power generation units to uh, achieve the energy, match the energy demand at minimum uh, fuel cost and minimum uh, carbon dioxide emissions. 
This is a very complicated optimization problem. It's hard to solve. It's been studied for many years and conventional methods struggle with it. And we found that um, the methods that we have can parallelize very nicely. These quantum uh, inspired optimization methods uh, can run uh, in parallel up to 50 times faster on the benchmarking instances that we've looked at compared to the industry standard solver for these unit commitment problems. And so this gives an example of the kind of things that uh, we are sort of uh, serendipitously getting into based on our focus on uh, customer problems and using the tools that we have, both hardware tools in terms of the developing quantum hardware, but also simply algorithmic and scientific insights that come out from our whole quantum program and really putting those to use. And it turns out that actually by engaging with these quantum inspired optimization methods, it, actually, it provides a path towards fully quantum solutions because um, it has been discovered that these uh, methods, which are technically what's called Markov chain methods, can be quadratically sped up uh, by running them instead on a quantum computer, uh, a sufficiently large quantum computer uh, using what are called quantum walks. So present day quantum computers are not large enough and robust enough to um, do these quantum walks and achieve this quadratic speed up, but there is a path. So to, by today you can run these uh, quantum inspired methods on CPUs or we can harden them onto GPUs or FPGAs and it paves the way towards uh, full further uh, acceleration when uh, the quantum hardware catches up. So that's uh, um, a very brief uh, bird's eye view of some of the things uh, going on in our quantum program at Microsoft. And I thought I would end with kind of a, a description of how you can get involved uh, should you be interested. And there are different levels of involvement. So the lightest weight kind of engagement is just to browse around on Azure Quantum. You can uh, try things with our private preview, run on some ion trap hardware. You can play around with our Q Sharp uh, programming language and quantum development kit. We've got quite a lot of documentation and tutorials around that, simulators uh, and uh, lots of tools you can download and use. We've got over 200,000 um, downloads of this and we're trying to build up a uh, community of developers around it. A slightly uh, more hands-on form of engagement is the Microsoft Quantum Network. We've especially partnered with quite a large number of uh, startups in the quantum space and very, are forming various forms of cooperation with them. And the most in-depth kind of uh, uh, engagement we have now is called the Early Access Program, where our subject matter experts in quantum meet directly with the subject matter experts uh, from uh, enterprise customers uh, to really map out in detail uh, how some of our present day tools such as quantum inspired optimization can be applied to industrial problems and really put into daily uh, production. And so uh, with that, I will uh, conclude the um, presentation and thank you for your attention. Stephen, thank you very much for this very insightful talk. For me, what uh, stuck with me is uh, the fact that uh, quantum computing is not a technology we can dream of. It's even something we can play with already today. Stephen, thank you very much. Please stay in the line. It would be our pleasure to uh, host you also for a, a hopefully very interesting talk in a minute. Now, I would like to welcome uh, one of my dearest colleagues, um, it's Juan, he is one of our young digital leaders at E.ON. So uh, Dr. Juan Bernabe Moreno received his PhD in computer science from the University of Granada in Spain. He has been leading data science and engineering teams in the telecommunication industry for more than eight years. Juan, you joined us in 2017, yeah. that's great. Uh, and you are now the Chief Data Officer and Head of the Global Data and Analytics Team. Ever since, you have been driving data-driven initiatives and you have been pushing AI to accelerate the energy transformation. But Juan, you are, you are also active in research. Mm -hmm. So you are visiting research uh, fellow at, for Responsible AI 
uh, in Oxford University and you are visiting research fe fellow for applied AI in University of Granada. So quite, quite a career. Um, you will now talk about quantum at the edge of AI. Mm -hmm. We are really, really thrilled and interested uh, to hear your talk and the stage is yours. Juan, please. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this warm welcome. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, I'm coming from the AI perspective and we are now embracing quantum. Um, AI is shaping the energy, energy world, right? Uh, if we have a look at each and every stage or kind of player in the ecosystem, it's clear that uh, algorithms are supporting, for example, the optimization of big um, energy plants. Algorithms are supporting the, the balancing of the grids, transition, distribution. We have agents helping us uh, learning with data uh, to optimize the energy consumption, to optimize the uh, infeed of our renewables. And algorithms are also uh, helping our consumers to get a better service, but also to participate in the decentralization of the energy, just by making their assets uh, um, available to everybody. Um, last but not least, algorithms are uh, helping to solve one of the unresolved issues, which is how to store energy for later use. We're going to see that uh, in a minute. AI. AI, uh, the, the most popular technique within AI is machine learning. Machine learning is nothing but uh, training a system so that uh, with an output and with an input, you try to figure out or to learn the rules, the behavior and rules of these outputs. And uh, we see here uh, how, for example, deep learning uh, works, right? You see a lot of layers and a lot of interactions. Uh, the problem with machine learning is like it requires a lot of data and it's very repetitive. So you really need to train your algorithms for a long period of time and of course it has some limitations. If we move on to something um, more kind of energy related which is kind of the optimization of a wind park uh, solving a problem called wake management which is kind of uh, the wind uh, shadow from a wind turbine to the next row uh, that's something that we solve with uh, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is nothing but, again, repetitive tasks, uh, giving our algorithms the possibility of uh, optimizing in space of possibilities. It's like uh, human learns. It's like uh, try and error, try and error, try and error, try and success at the end. That's uh, reinforcement learning, right? Now, AI, machine learning, they have some limitations. And these some limitations, they are having a substantial impact. Let me just highlight the top six, right? The first one is like uh, our complexity is increasing. So we get more and more data, we get more and more um, variables interplaying, and the world is getting more and more complex. So uh, it's really, really difficult to cope with this kind of complexity. The second one is like uh, the Moore's law. The Moore's law is being kind of uh, saturated now means that uh, it's not easy to double the amount of transistors anymore uh, every certain years. So you are getting to a saturation, which, which implies that our computing power is getting insufficient. The third limitation, something that worries us a lot, is like the CO2 footprint of AI. I mean, uh, there are some studies already, and uh, we know, for example, that uh, training the GPT-2 model, which is uh, one very popular NLP uh, model, requires as much energy as uh, the lifetime of five cars, right? Now, the new one, the GPT-3, um, with uh, half a billion parameters, probably could power a small city for a month. And of course, it's not sustainable. Next problem is that AI is very data savvy, means that you require a lot of data. And of course, you run into, um, well, debates like uh, who owns the data? The Googles, the Microsoft, for sure, of this world, but uh, what happens to the others? It's a problem. Next one is lack of transparency. We know how to train AI models, but we, sometimes it's difficult to explain why these AI models come to these conclusions. So, and that's, uh, well, it remains an issue of research, but it's there. And the last one is not uh, an AI problem. This one is like a classic computing problem which is like uh, the world, also the nature of our nature is quantum. And it's very difficult to represent a quantum reality into a bit uh, simulation. 
So for example, here to represent a, a molecule of, of coffee, you could need uh, uh, 10 to, uh, um, to the power 48 bits. And of course, it's not uh, doable, right? Now, how does quantum computing help? Quantum computing relies on quantum mechanics. And I'm not going to explain quantum mechanics, but I'm going to highlight three properties here that uh, Thomas mentioned before uh, that are really, really important for uh, and kind of uh, solving these particular issues. One is uh, superposition. Superposition means that uh, a particle can be in two stage, uh, states at the same time. While in the classical computing, we have one bit, which can be zero and one, right? When you observe this particle, then it can really converge to a particular one. The other one is entanglement. Basically, entanglement is just uh, the fact that uh, two part uh, particles can be connected uh, without having a physical connection. And uh, you change one, and uh, it translates into the change in the other one. And the third one, also mentioned by Stephen, is like uh, tunneling. Tunneling is extremely, extremely interesting for us to solve optimization problems. Because tunneling means that you don't have to uh, you know, um, go through all potential as, um, solutions and combinations uh, in one space in a sequential way. You can really jump to the minimum um, immediately, right? How do these uh, features help? Of course, uh, for example, if you think of uh, four qubits, four, so four, four, sorry, two qubits that you entangle, right? Then you could have uh, four bisect states. One zero, zero one, one one, zero zero. Now, in the classic uh, computing, in order to double, the, so to double the, the, the computing capacity, you would need another two and another two. So you really need to replicate the same size according to Moore law. But in this case, in quantum case, you just add one qubit. So you really um, double the size just by adding one qubit. Well, if you try to, for example, to represent all the atoms in the universe in a system, you would need only 300 qubits. Our systems today, they are not there, but they, it's not uh, undoable, right? Tunneling suppo is supporting us already with optimization problems. Everything related to optimization, almost everything can be formulated as a minimum problem, uh, a local global minimum, and tunneling, this particular feature, is helping us to get in there. And many others, right? Let me just uh, explain a few words on where we are now, right? First of all, building a quantum computer is extremely difficult. And uh, we have companies that are doing that for many years, uh, one of them being Microsoft for sure, uh, but many others with different uh, ways. You, you see here you know, the level of uh, temperature that's required to, to, to stabilize a quantum system. If you uh, decrease the temperature, even uh, below the outer space temperature, uh, the quantum um, mechanics uh, exhibit better, right? So you get uh, less noise. You see here the degrees in this image, just going down uh, level by level by level until you get to minus 273 degrees. So, but uh, quantum today is, uh, as Stephen said, uh, not very mature. So quantum inspired algorithms can solve uh, problems today. The quantum technology, depending on how you uh, try to build a computer, can be more or less mature. If we get, for example, the annealing, quantum annealing, which is just specific to solve a particular problem with uh, manufacturers like D-Wave, uh, they are kind of uh, solving just very focused one problem, and they are, in terms of maturity level, um, a bit farther away. Um, universal computers with uh, logical gates, quantum logical gates, which are more uh, versatile, where you can represent any kind of problems, they are, um, well, they are not that far, but uh, actually most of the problems we dream of solving with quantum require this capacity, right? So, now, this slide that you see there is quite packed, but I wanted to have the top 10. The top 10 uh, quantum computing and AI uh, marriage um, problems that we want to solve in the energy world, right? Let me just uh, go for, uh, by a few ones. Batteries. With quantum, we will be in a position of uh, developing uh, or advancing the material science. So we will be also developing batteries uh, away from lithium and iron, so, and we will be uh, developing these batteries in a very efficient way, 
with materials that are not required so heavy, so heavy conductors, heavy metals, right? And again, apart from the benefit in terms of energy storage, you get a massive um, um, environmental impact um, uh, saved. Right? Next one is large optimization problems. If you think of um, decentralized energy systems, you start having a lot of variables, a lot of assets, uh, people with PVs, people with uh, um, electric cars, uh, a storage here, um, hydrogen there. So the system becomes very, very, very difficult to optimize. And that's uh, one of the hopes that we put on the quantum technology combined with AI. Climate models, nobody has modeled the climate so far. Yet, understanding the climate is vital for us if we want to kind of uh, overcome the volatility of renewables. The same that I mentioned before, way, uh, way can lay out optimization in large wind parks. Something very vital because you take this decision once and uh, if you get it right, you can get a lot of yield. Um, quantum systems, they are especially um, kind of adequate to model graphs. And all the networks that we have, they end up being a graph structure. So our power network, our gas network, heat networks, they are graphs. And the graphs can be mapped into a quantum computer and optimized nicely. Right? The next one is optimal energy procurement, trading, and hedging. We had a talk before about uh, you know, the challenges posed by uh, procuring and sourcing energy, especially for E.ON, where we just uh, don't have large-scale generation. So for us, it's really important to um, anticipate prices, demand, so that we can hedge and we can procure our, uh, the best uh, way ever our energy. A huge optimization problem. Next one is something that uh, we haven't done before, I think, that I really like and I think is possible with quantum. Energy, the energy world is extremely regulated, which means that uh, when you introduce a regulation, sometimes it backfires. Sometimes the consequences of regulating something are not considered when you decide to regulate something. Now, with quantum, we have the possibility of putting many, many variables into the system so that you can run a proper simulation. This simulation can help us uh, anticipate and improve regulations before they are imposed. For us, vital. Okay, next one is clear. I mean, Stephen mentioned it before, uh, quantum is going to be the killer application for the cryptography the way we know it. We are running critical infrastructure we really need to embrace a post-quantum cryptography so that we can protect our infrastructure. Last one, I don't know, almost last one is immobility. Immobility uh, has a problem, which is like you really need to optimize your grids, but also your fleet, and the battery, you, ha you have a complex optimization problem. Volkswagen has been doing um, very successfully the optimization of the taxis uh, in a joint way, in Beijing, and they are bringing it to, to Lisbon now. So um, we see a lot of possibilities here. Last but not least, for prediction, detection, and propagation, which is a, a clear one. Um, I would like to bring you one example here, one example that we are implementing at Tion, which is large-scale optimization for the central assets. The particular use case that we are talking about here is vehicle-to-grid. Vehicle-to-grid consists of using the battery of your um, electric car while it is parked and you are not going to need it, right? Why do you use this battery for? To support stabilizing the grid, to kind of commercialize your energy, and why not uh, to help uh, maybe your local community? This problem is extremely complex because of one reason, or mainly because of one reason, which is the dimensionality curve. You have so many dimensions, especially when you have uh, more and more e-vehicles. When you get, for example, beyond uh, the, the barrier of uh, uh, 500, 1,000 cars. You need to understand, you know, to predict the availability, you need to optimize the bids. You need also to steer in a 15 minutes interval uh, the amount of energy, and then you need to really steer the assets. So you need to charge and discharge in intervals in a way that uh, the comfort of the people is not impacted in a way that uh, you don't overcharge the kind of your low voltage network and in a way that uh, by the time that the user said, well, I need my car now, you have enough, you have fully charged your battery, right? But also considering some far constraints like uh, if I have an emergency, I, I, I need the minimum uh, uh, charge. 
this particular problem is uh, something that for us is a reality already. We have implemented it in a quantum computer, and uh, right now we are um, protecting our IP for sure, but uh, we are thinking on how to scale that. And uh, scaling that is going to be a very interesting uh, topic. To conclude, just uh, to leave you with a message here, um, it's not either or. It's not quantum is the next AI, no. Quantum, quantum computing is key to overcome the uh, problems and the limitations we have today with AI. And secondly, quantum computing, in order to evolve, needs to make the most of AI technology. And um, I don't think that you can separate them anymore, quantum computing and AI in a few years. They are going to go hand in hand and they are going to just make us uh, take the energy transition to the next level. That's what we want at TM. Thank you. Juan, thank you very much. Please join me for our talk now because I'm sure there are tons of questions uh, from uh, our spectators outside mm. at the screens. Um, the first one is actually uh, coming uh, from our virtual uh, auditory. Mm. And um, Stephen, you are back with us. Yes, hi. Hi. So the first one is uh, I would uh, like you uh, to take this. So um, what is in your point of view, what is the role of the physical infrastructure for the future applications? So the fiber networks, the data uh, centers. Um, if uh, we progress with, uh, let's say, uh, AI and uh, uh, quantum computing, uh, do we create an engine that at the end of the day has no gearbox and no wheels when we don't, uh, let's say, uh, also improve uh, the physical infrastructure which is necessary? I see, yes. Um, I think the various pieces of infrastructure all tied together. You, you, um, as they say, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And so with quantum computing, um, the, the actual physical quantum computers are not something you'd really want uh, in your house, for example. Um, as uh, Juan mentioned, these uh, operate at uh, very close to absolute zero, and they're in, in usually uh, in liquid helium. So these are things you really want inside of your data centers. And so then for your, to have uh, good use cases for these, you'll need um, good bandwidth and good latency uh, to send your data to and from these data centers. So the way I think about it is um, inside these data centers, there's actually now a growing array of different kinds of hardware. Uh, a growing diversity. So as uh, Moore's law is starting to slow down, we can no longer just rely on clock speeds getting automatically faster and faster to solve all our problems. Instead, we see a lot of specialized hardware for different problems. So we have uh, GPUs, which are used for a lot of machine learning applications. We have FPGAs, which uh, can be reprogrammed. Uh, to emulate uh, ASICs, and we have even special uh, purpose chips for doing, uh, say, tensor contractions in, in um, machine learning, and then we have our quantum hardware. And so uh, I expect in the future, um, people may be insulated from this choice of hardware, that there's some kind of API call they make, and there's some kind of, uh, say, machine learning tool which kind of looks at this data coming in and says, well, I think this is most suitable for a quantum processor, or I think this is most suitable for a GPU and it can dispatch it uh, automatically. So all these different pieces of hardware kind of build up into a, uh, a whole that can be um, in some ways greater than the um, sum of the parts. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Juan, let us stay for a moment before I take the next <laughs> question from the auditory, let's stay for a moment uh, at the question, what does quantum needs to really propel? Um, you referred a lot to the combination between quantum and yeah. AI. Mm. 
Is there anything else where you say that would be uh, a propelling factor for quantum computing really to go through the roof in future? Mm -hmm. So la yesterday we talked a lot about uh, distributed ledger technologies, yeah. blockchain. Is there a connection between those technologies? I think one of the, of the most important things is the adoption. Um, adoption means that you need to put in place the means uh, for people to really get familiar with this technology. So you, you really need uh, for programmers or for AI practitioners uh, a way of interacting with this technology. So you need an SDK, you need uh, proper APIs, and uh, the, the, the more you lower the entry barrier, the higher kind of uh, the likelihood of this technology to, to become mainstream, right? Mm -hmm. Yet it's going to take a while, but uh, we need to grow the community. I think that's the, the most powerful way of making it happen. Sure, thanks. <laughs> Would you like to take also ne the next one, which is coming from uh, the auditory, and now it's gone again. Um, all right, so I just read it on the screen, and now it's gone. Take another one. <laughs> um, is it available to allow uh, artificial intelligence, AI, to do all the work instead of the human element? So it's an almost philosophical question. Yeah, What that's is your take <laughs> on this one? Um, I think, um, to be honest, I really believe in the, in the joint uh, work. I think AI can make us better. AI cannot ever replace us. AI can replace some task in a very concrete way where we, the AI can outperform us, that's for sure. But, uh, um, I mean, we are still far away from uh, general artificial intelligence and uh, I don't think I'm going to be witnessing that in, in, in my life, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> I just see that we have some quants uh, also in the auditory. There is one question I would pass over to Stephen. So do you focus on NISQ and variational approaches for near term? or aim for fault-tolerant long-term quantum computing? Um. Yes, so that's a great question. Um, so it, there's really two different uh, visions of quantum computing, uh, depending on whether you have error correction or not. And if you don't have error correction, that's called the NISQ or NISC quantum computers. Mm -hmm. These may be able to do a few things um, that conventional computers cannot but they're quite limited. Mm -hmm. And so our primary focus is more on the long-term um, fault tolerant uh, quantum computing. So NISC machines may be able to solve um, some kind of molecular ground state uh, problems that are possibly out of reach for classical computers, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a tough uh, needle to thread because <laughs> Uh, a problem with uh, these uh, NISC era algorithms for doing chemistry is that um, the number of measurements that you need, the number of repetitions of this experiment that you need to tune the parameters of the model uh, can be extremely large. And so to find just the right molecules so that it's feasible with a NISC machine and infeasible with uh, conventional uh, supercomputing techniques, it's, it's not easy. Okay. Um, and so, so our main focus is really the fault-tolerant, more general machines. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Juan, there is a, a spot-on question to your <laughs> use cases. So yep. uh, the question goes, can you share on what is your decision variable on the EV problem you want to optimize? Well, that's, uh, I mean, there, I mean, it's a multivariable optimization, right? Uh, we need to optimize for the economic impact or benefit uh, at, uh, at EV level on one hand. On the other hand, uh, we need to preserve also the, all the constraints like uh, particular state of charge uh, at the beginning, particular state of charge at the end. Uh, um, also some batteries, they are not bidirectional, which means like they just have, um, you can just steer in one way, other other batteries are bidirectional, which means that you can also, um, well, uh, not only charge, but also discharge. So um, there are many, many constraints, but at the end, uh, what we are optimizing for is like, uh, you know, what you make as a, as a vehicle owner, right? Okay. Now, um, another question from, from me. So, I mean, you are both uh, uh, reputable technicians, <laughs> but uh, if we think about social problems of nowadays, uh, and even uh, conflict, uh, conflicts in the future. Mm -hmm. I was uh, really intrigued from your take on what could be the role of quantum in game theory. Yeah. Uh, would you expect that uh, social interactions, mm -hmm. 
even between states or even uh, warfare will mm. be uh, influenced by quantum computing in the future. Uh, who of you would like to answer this question? I can answer this one with one example, right? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I've done my PhD in social network analysis. And there are problems that you cannot solve with uh, the conventional computers, right? Um, I think having a look at these problems after a while, right, uh, from the quantum um, optimization perspective, and suddenly these problems, they become solvable, right? Um, theoretically, with some POC at, at a POC level, but it opens for you a new ways of, for example, uh, analyze the social networks in a way that you can even detect uh, fake news, you can even, uh, at large scale, you can really detect uh, communities, uh, how balanced they are, so you can really intervene in the social dialogue. Uh, I'm working on a piece of research on that. I think um, this kind of technology can help you uh, address problems from the past, in my case, very social, with social impact. Deep, uh, so deep yeah. fake, fake news is something that is, gonna, um, is affecting us, unfortunately, at the Ooh, moment. Stephen, is it good news or is it scary? <laughs> what, what do you think about it? Well, uh, um, my, my thought about this question is, uh, first of all, these issues of uh, conflict, um, can we formulate uh, a computational problem in the first place? Um, and one, one way to think about that, I think, is if you imagine any kind of conflict, say uh, a lawsuit, it's very costly for both sides to, uh, to pay these lawyers. And in a sense, that expense is wasted on, this, uh, on the side of the, uh, uh, that's going to lose this lawsuit. And similarly, uh, in warfare, uh, mm -hmm. the same, same thing, but uh, the cost, of course, being even more uh, profound. And uh, so in a sense, you could view uh, conflicts as, as a failure of forecasting. <laughs> if you had uh, better uh, models that could predict uh, which side was, uh, was going to prevail and which side was uh, uh, not going to uh, succeed, then, then you could sort of uh, settle uh, right from the very beginning and, and negotiate some uh, uh, settlement or surrender or whatever the case may be without having to uh, go through in the actual physical world the, the conflict itself. So I think there is a way of formulating uh, avoidance of conflict as a computational problem, uh, sort of a forecasting problem. And then as to whether quantum computing helps, I, I think that's an open question. Uh, I, I certainly don't know the answer. I take for a moment that quantum computing will disrupt uh, the law firm business as well. Take it as an encouraging uh, <laughs> news so far. Um, and also to you, Stephen, uh, uh, that I think that's a good question for a vendor of the <laughs> technology. What are the costs at the moment to deploy this technology in a company? Well, um, so certainly the R&D cost of developing quantum computers is high. Um, it's really mostly the domain of uh, large information technology companies and uh, nation states. Um, the operational cost of quantum computers might not necessarily be high. So um, although you do need uh, cooling for these devices, um, it's not so much that you need a lot of cooling power. You really just need low temperatures. And so the actual energy costs of uh, quantum computers uh, might be um, a lot less uh, daunting than one might expect. So he's um, playing the ball back a lot back of to engineering us. to be done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's already in our True. portfolio now. <laughs> yeah. There was just a, a question which I found really interesting, but it's gone again. I tried to memorize it. <laughs> um, uh, and that's for you, Juan. Uh, is there already, uh, let's say, a concrete deployment, a concrete use case mm -hmm. where the superiority of uh, quantum is uh, proven in E.ON, at yeah. E.ON? Uh, well, um, if you take this uh, vehicle to grid, uh, we've proven that uh, we can really optimize that uh, a couple of uh, order of magnitudes uh, faster. Um, I wouldn't dare to say that uh, we've proven quantum superiority, right? Um, we are coming always from the application perspective. Mm. We have quantum experts that they know what they are doing as well. And uh, we, we are very modest in terms of uh, we solve a problem that we have, but we don't, um, you know, 
target that uh, that's what Eon has done quantum superiority <laughs> okay and um, another question which is uh, targeting also in that direction along the tech and stack and many roles mm. forming where do you see your focus uh, and where would you like more ecosystem support yeah, yeah. from an eon point of view yeah so first of all uh, quantum is a, is a technology that we cannot uh, do alone it's like uh, well, first of all the hardware we are not gonna ever build a quantum computer i think right <laughs> that's uh, clear uh, but it's more uh, it goes beyond the hardware it's, it just required proper experts in-house to understand what we are doing um, again, for me, the marriage quantum AI is very important. So you need to be to connect these experts uh, to the AI um, way of solving problems. But uh, more and more, you need the proper partners to help you, you know, model problems, uh, access to particular hardware. Um, we are partnering a lot with universities. We are partnering a lot with the startups, um, um, also with big companies. It's something that uh, you really need the whole ecosystem to drive. Otherwise, it's like, um, well, it's going to be hard. That brings me also to an interesting uh, question, or at least it's interesting for me. So uh, how can I imagine the future of, uh, let, let's uh, assume for a moment quantum computing is a new normal. Yeah. Um, will it be an, an architecture that the central quantum computing is standing somewhere powering the cloud, or is it something I will have in my, in my <laughs> suit pocket in future? A uh, small uh, <laughs> smartphone powered by quantum. You're going to have probably applications powered by quantum. I don't think you're going to have a quantum computer in your pocket. Um, okay. uh, but for sure, you're going to have access to um, computation done by a quantum computer, probably uh, through a cloud technology, as we have today, actually. Okay. <laughs> Stephen, what is your prediction? Are you on the same page like Juan? Yes, uh, 100%. I agree with Juan. Okay, good. Um, and uh, another one, uh, Stephen, your view on how we understand the performance of renewable assets given their volatility and the impact on trading uh, as one of the first use cases in energy so far. Yes, well, um, so I'm, uh, I'm not sure I have a comprehensive example uh, answer to that, but I can give an example. So, um, if you start to have a larger fraction of uh, photovoltaics, for example, in, in your um, portfolio of power sources, then um, this actually makes the unit commitment optimization problem more challenging because the um, forecasts for demand are um, more unpredictable and they vary more throughout the day as the solar radiance changes as clouds go by and so on. And so, you may not be satisfied with day ahead optimization anymore. You might want to, in real time, recompute your optimal unit commitment plans. And uh, for this, uh, conventional methods that people are currently using to solve this problem in, over the course of hours uh, are not going to be good enough. And so if you can find a, a order of magnitude or two speed up from using, say, quantum inspired optimization, then that can really change the whole way that you operate, where you optimize in real time instead of day ahead. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, there is another question. I thought it was already answered by your presentation, <laughs> uh, Juan, but let's ask it again. Are you thinking of using quantum algos in the trading area, means in the procurement area of Eon? Well, I think if we consider uh, the tax that we solve in trading, right? One tax is for uh, is forecasting. The other tax is optimization. Uh, quantum computers, they can help us massively in the optimization tasks. So uh, my answer is, why not? Mm. Are we doing that today? Uh, not yet. Uh, do we see a possibility of doing that? Probably, why not? Uh, actually, quantum computers can really tackle this problem very well. Okay. Let me, uh, we are almost uh, done with mm. our talk, so uh, let me ask a personal question to mm. you, which has nothing to do with quantum, <laughs> but uh, as one of our young digital leaders, um, who is your role model in <laughs> IT and digitization? Is it yeah. Turing or...? Uh, well, I would like to mention two names here. One is like um, for AI, one of the big names that we, are, we have the pleasure of working with is Professor Schmidt Huber. Mm -hmm. Um, in the quantum space, of course, I need to, to name Richard Feynman because obviously he's kind of one of the uh, kind of uh, um, well, uh, 
popes, of, if you want to, if you allow me to use the word pope uh, of this particular uh, sure. technology. Right? Thank you. <laughs> Stephen, what about you? Who is your guiding star? Is there a person? Um, yes, well, I, I, in a sense, I feel like there's a constellation of stars, uh, <laughs> Feynman being one of them, uh, Alan Turing, as you mentioned, being another, uh, and, uh, for me also, Peter Shore, I would say, uh, is someone I've always, uh, wanted, wanted to em emulate as, yeah. as many of us do in the quantum algorithms business His uh, his discovery of the factoring algorithm in 1994 was just so dramatic uh, uh awesome i'm not sure anything quite like that has been replicated since but That's we true. would all yeah. like to thank you thank you very much Stephen. thank you very much juan you, Thomas. very interesting talk very inspiring presentations and good luck for the future thank you thomas thank you Stephen. thanks for having us <laughs>